Well, welcome everybody. It's good to see you here. It's excellent to have so many on board. Welcome to the um, IceWarm monthly webinar. Uh, today's topic, Water Trading, presented by Alistair Walsh from uh, Waterfind, CEO of Waterfind. I'm Trevor Pilly, National Partnerships Manager, uh, and I'll be chairing. Today. Well, today what we're going to do is split the session in two. The first 15 minutes is going to be Alistair pre presenting, and then the second 15 minutes will be open to all for a, for a Q&A. Uh, we're going to record the webinar, and we'll send the link to you uh, to, to view uh, later with your colleagues, but uh, the last thing there, the feedback, we'd really love to have your comments on this. It'll take about a minute actually to do this feedback. All your comments are welcome, good, bad, ugly, That's, it helps us shape the future webinars. That will be excellent. So today, uh, Alistair Walsh, uh, CEO of Waterfind, is regarded as one of the most knowledgeable Australian water market professionals, experienced in irrigation communities, understands the way users manage their water security and interact with the market. He has an extensive career in agriculture, raised in agriculture actually, business development and account management. Uh, we, we're just going to look forward now to you, uh, to what you have to say to us, Alistair. We'll hand right over to you now and uh, and uh, we'll, we'll be really interested to see what you've got to say. Thank you for, thank you for joining us, Alistair. Yeah, thank you, Trevor, and um, and thank you to Icewarm uh, for the opportunity uh, and uh, welcome everybody and I look forward to uh, hearing uh, from you all uh, a little later with some questions. I, what I wanted to do was perhaps give you a bit of an overview initially as to um, what is water trade, uh, how is it developed in Australia, um, and uh, how uh, uh, irrigators, how they matured uh, their engagement with um, uh, and, and, and matured their management of their, their water resource uh, that they, um, you know, that does form an integral part of uh, of their businesses, so um, why do we why do we need water trade? We live in obviously a, a varying uh, climatic um, system. You only have to look outside uh, the weather. We've had the last uh, couple of months to um, to see how quickly our our system can change. Looking back, um, obviously we had the millennial drought period, uh, and again that was a, a a period of time where we went from um, severe depletion of resource to um, to significant. Uh, uh, reversal. Uh, we had situations you can see here. Lake Yildon, uh, uh, within a couple of years, had responded um, to the to the increasing inflows. Um, we know that uh, um, that the lower lakes in South Australia also um, responded uh, quite quickly. You know, we had had calls that it would take a number of years um, of above average rainfall for those lakes to even consider being back to uh, uh, to, to a, a stable level and and again it, it happened um, over the course of a, of a very short period of time and, and surprised a lot of people um, this is just obviously again just illustrating the the level of variance that we operate within uh, in Australia and and so what we what we need and what our uh, our agriculture community need is needs is a, is a way to actually manage that, that variance. Uh, now, uh, we've developed, or within the Australian um, water regulatory, regulatory framework, we've developed a structure uh, that, it, that enables irrigators to actually uh, share a uh, resource to, it, to transact between each other. And, uh, and in times of, uh, of plenty, uh, those that are able to scale up and, and use more water are able to, to get more productivity and, and activity out of it. In times when uh, things become a li little bit leaner, then we see uh, an activity or a market movement towards those irrigators that, that need their, their water for, um, for securing permanent plantings or, or um, critical need requirements. What is water trading in itself? Really, it's, it's the ability for uh, an irrigator uh, who has a, a defined right to, to trade with another irrigator, another water user. Uh, it's really broken up into a couple of different different segments. The, the the main two parts of it being temporary market or temporary transaction market, which is where we're trading the the usable volume of water available to an irrigator in any one particular year. So that's their their share of the uh, of the overall inflows or the overall resource. And then there's also um, the, the permanent market, which is uh, where an irrigator uh, holds a a water right, a long term right. It's generally a perpetual or in perpetuity right, uh, and uh, they, uh, they can choose uh, to, and that, that's really where they drive their share of the resource. They get a, a, a defined uh, amount of water based on uh, a priority, priority system. And, uh, and basically within both these, with both these types of rights, they can, be, they can be traded. So an irrigator can just trade off some of their unused water in one year to an irrigator who, who needs to, uh, to top up and use more water, 
or alternatively, they can, if they decide, sell down some or all of their, their water right, their long-term permanent right, to another irrigator uh, who, who may be looking to expand his, his operation or, or, or levels of production. Out of those two markets and those two um, defined uh, right markets, um, we have the, the development of, of forward markets. We also have the development of, of other types of markets that uh, sit uh, or complementary types of products that sit around uh, the, the ownership or, or different um, opportunities that the ownership of the permanent water right enables. And this is, uh, this, these are um, uh, products like carryover, uh, which is an ability to take the usable water from one year to, a, to another year. Leasing, long-term leasing capability, where a, uh, an irrigator may not be using their water, but will will lease that that water in the same way you might lease it, lease a house or a building to another uh, another irrigator who does want to scale up but doesn't have the capability or uh, doesn't want to deploy capital into ownership of that that water right. So we have other other products that that come come uh, or sit in around around uh, the these two core markets, being the, the temporary and permanent market, and and these. Really, out of out of those two core markets, we we see the development of of risk management tools or uh, water security um, products that that enable uh, irrigators to to forward plan and manage the resource that they they require. The the way that trading uh, has initially developed, um, we have seen trading uh, really since quite a, quite a while. Really, the, you know, thirty five to forty years, um, had, we've seen trading occur. Uh, within uh, within particularly the southern Murray Darling Basin, uh, that's where where trade has has developed uh, initially and and matured. Uh, and initially, that was in very localised um, areas. So it was between farmer to farmer, generally uh, over the back fence, uh, one irrigator needing a bit more and the other having a a little bit to spare. And farmers uh, or irrigators coming together and agreeing to uh, to transact and provide water to each other. Uh, over time, we've seen the development of intermediaries in this space, and this has enabled, um, this has partly been facilitated by the need uh, or the ability to trade water over, over much larger areas. And that's where, that's where obviously Waterfind and, and a number of other intermediaries have, have stepped in the space to, us, to, to enable more transparency, uh, but also interconnectivity uh, of irrigators across quite large uh, large areas, and so we move to. Um, this, we're focusing on the southern uh, Murray Darling Basin here, but all of these areas, the, the Murray, the Murrumbidgee, the Northern Victoria rivers, um, at one time or another, have an ability to interact and trade. Uh, so uh, temporary water, that again, that usable volume of water, uh, can be moved right across this system based on the, um, you know, the, the, the underlying operational capability of, of the Murray-Darling Basin and the, the um, system and the, the storage, the dams, the weirs. Uh, that's really the mechanics of moving, moving the water. Um, you overlay that with, with some rules around where water can move and you create a market that, that enables uh, irrigators to interact. So we have irrigators in the Murrumbidgee that are able to actually transact at times and trade water with irrigators down the bottom end of the, uh, the Murray system or from, from that area back up into uh, into the Goulburn River, and really th what that enables is coming back to that um, that uh, discussion around variance in our in our natural system. It enables uh, us to to consolidate and combine the, the the rights, the water that is available across a vast uh, area, and enable uh, again um, irrigators to manage that variance um, and and to be able to accumulate the quantities that they need as and when they need it. This is just looking at uh, at the last uh, ten or fifteen years of of volume available uh, in uh, or storages of, of, and water availability in in the uh, uh, in the Murray Darling Basin and the Southern Murray Darling Basin. And what it obviously is indicating um, is just the levels of variance. So what we're looking at here is, um, as I said, uh, storages, and we can see periods when um, we've seen very low uh, low inflows. We can see through the um, you know, from about 2001 onwards, we started to really mine down and, and had failed inflow periods, particularly through that period, uh, failed winter inflow periods, particularly uh, in that period of the uh, the winter of, of 2005 2006, where we saw very low um, low levels of inflows and and quite dramatic drawdown of of the available water resource in that 2006 2007 water year. Again. Certainly not the levels of replenishment um, over those couple of years that um, we needed in order to provide the required water, and they were very tough years for, for irrigators. The market sat in behind that period and and did provide 
uh, water uh, to those who who needed it, but but obviously the supply um, or the lack of supply was um, was a was a pretty difficult period of time and and, and a key consideration for irrigators. You can see how quickly the, the system can replenish. So uh, the back of uh, that 2010 2011 uh, water year, we saw the system replenish quite significantly, and we have actually been in a situation over the last uh, three to four years where um, we have drawn down uh, the available the available resource, the stored resource that, that we had in those systems, um, to the point where um, back in May of, of this year, and before that we we were in quite a in a period when uh, there was certainly some some serious concern about um, whether we were moving back into a into a significantly dry period, uh, and uh, certainly if we had not received uh, or if we if we had received the same levels of inflows uh, that we received going from the uh, 14, uh, 15 water year that we've received going into the into the 16, 17 water year, we would have been in in some pretty dire dire situations. But as you can see, uh, the response uh, to uh, that we've had since May uh, this year has been quite significant, and so we've seen significant inflows, and that's continuing obviously uh, at, at the moment. Five minutes, Alistair. Not a problem, Trevor. Um, so again, this is just uh, showing the levels of of flow over the last. A uh, couple of years, and um, you know, showing the difference in cut in outlook where we've been uh, in, through an inflow period last year. You can see the comparison to the long term average, and and certainly the response uh, that we've seen this year is quite significant and and quite above average uh, uh, inflows. So where to next? Um, certainly, I mean, as I've mentioned, we you know markets have have provided irrigators with the capability of um, of providing them with the supply of water that they need in both wet and dry uh, periods of time. It's also provided them with the capability appropriately setting value uh, uh, for the water that they have and the water that they use. And I think that's one of the key outcomes that have developed through, through the use of, of water markets. Um, the benefit of um, being able to actually value what you use or what you don't use and waste and, and or waste um, is, is incredibly important. And it's led to irrigators and other water users being able to look at and value and invest um, in efficiencies in actually uh, making their, uh, their water use more targeted, more effective, and be able to go to uh, their finances and say, you know, look, if we uh, spend this money, um, if you fund us into spending this money, we can save X number of megalitres in our production and, and also deliver uh, a more productive um, outcome and, better, and a higher, um, uh, better, better value. Water trading has has obviously also enabled the development of new industries and and the ability of to be able to move water around has and and consolidate water has enabled us to um, to develop um, the almond industry for example in Australia and other uh, industries which are over time uh, meaning that we are seeing um, quite significant high value returns out of every megalitre that we use we are uh, twice or three times as effective with our water use and and generate quite those sort of level. Two, two times return out of our water in Australia on average than, for example, uh, irrigators do in, in the United States, which is, a, which is a key to our success and our, and our continued productivity in times when we, we will see um, you know, more stress on, uh, on these resources. Maturity of market, irrigators have a, have a much greater understanding of uh, where they can source water from. Uh, as I said, they can source water uh, on a temporary basis from all of these regions in the southern and the connected system. Um, they can source temporary water in that space, but they can also actually source uh, permanent rights from, from different areas as well. And the ability of, uh, of sourcing those permanent rights enables irrigators to spread their risk of delivery, spread their risk of, of, of supply of water, um, because no, no one water right is exactly the same. They all have different characteristics based on their state-based legislation on on how these water rights were defined and and the priority system or the priority class that that uh, that define them so there's lots of of, of real uh, of benefits in in irrigators actually looking at, at having a diversified portfolio of of, of water rights and and actually uh, just in the same way that you would diversify perhaps a share portfolio you actually um, it, it provides greater security and better risk management um, there's also as I've said a greater understanding of the market of accessibility to water, uh, and that I, I think um, has certainly set us up for a, a situation where, you know, if we go back to the millennial drought, we saw quite significant 
volatility in 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 temporary pricing and uh, and some and some significant concern about people's ability to actually access water. We went into the last last six to nine months where we've had uh, potentially conditions that were looking extremely dry. We've obviously seen a reversal of that 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 fact, but conditions that whilst they were looking um, extremely dry, we had a much more mature um, approach in the way that irrigators were. Uh, we're approaching that drier period where they were looking at, at managing or, or hedging the potential drying conditions by uh, carrying water over, by locking in forward contracts and securing water ahead of the, the dry water year ahead, and by also looking to diversify their, their sources of water. And, and that certainly um, has set irrigators up, uh, that thinking is set, setting irrigators up to um, rather than just wait for uh, an event or for a circumstance to happen to them, uh, they're actually being um, proactive in actually managing uh, managing those water supply risks and also those pricing risks. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to the questions, Trevor, and uh, I'll hand it over to you. Fantastic. To, to ask a person to summarise their life in 15 minutes must be something like the shark tank, Alistair. So it's just, a, just a, um, uh, an incredible thing to be doing. But I look, appreciate the, uh, the huge huge diversity of topics you're picking up as you go through those last 15 minutes and uh, and that we all do. Uh, look, as we go next into the Q&A, you can either type your question using that Q&A button there, and there's a couple of questions come up already, or if you wanted to ask a live question, you've got good uh, audio visuals, you know, good lighting and you've got good internet speed. If you raise your hand, we'll uplift you and you can ask it on screen. That, that That's a good thing too. But uh, look, maybe we'll kick off... Uh, uh, with the questions we've already got there now, so there's a couple uh, that came in earlier. Uh, one from Linda Kelly. I think you might have that in front of you now. Have you got that now there, Alistair? Uh, yes. uh, yep. When government first entered the water market for environmental purchase, there were three caveats placed on the trade. Only purchase from willing sellers. There's three caveats. Only purchase from will willing sellers. Second one, must comply with National Water Initiative and don't distort the market. Well, has this been achieved? This is what uh, Linda has put, put forward from... Um, AWA. Yeah, look, I, I think um, to, to answer Linda's question, I think it's very, it's, it was would have always been and has been difficult for the um, the, the Commonwealth Government to and the government to uh, to purchase the level of water uh, that they have out of the market, and they have purchased from willing sellers. Nobody was forced to uh, uh, to sell their water, and certainly um, in a number of circumstances, it gave irrigators uh, some some options uh, through a really dry period uh, and, a, and a pretty challenging period to, to, to take on take that those good prices that the Commonwealth were providing at the time. But it's very difficult, I think, to say for them to actually claim that they couldn't distort the market because just in the, in the sheer volumes of water that they have purchased, they have certainly um, some of that water that they've bought back was was what we perhaps call sleeper licences or underutilised water uh, that was, and certainly in the first tranches of the government buyback process, we would have seen some of that water being been taken up uh, and that was probably water that wasn't necessarily um, available to other irrigators at the time anyway but um, but I think um, you know there's no getting away and we've had you know a number of reports recently Aether have put out a number of reports that have indicated that that not only uh, was there um, was their impact on uh, the the permanent markets or the price at that time of time of purchase but you know, potentially there is a um, an ongoing uh, impact that um, that not having these entitlements within the space um, will have on on temporary pricing. On the plus side, we we have seen through this period a, a significant maturity of the market itself. And so, whilst water has been removed, um, we've also seen significant volumes of water uh, activate and and the market become much more active. So that irrigators are using um, much more effectively the water that is available and that they are trading much more effectively um, as well. And I think that has uh, lessened to a certain extent some of the impact that that Commonwealth buyback has had. Uh, thanks a lot. That's, that's excellent. So Amy Williams has a, has a question also, and it goes like this. In South Australia, the water market is obviously relatively, relatively mature for the River Murray. But I'd be interested, uh, says Amy, in Alice's comments on new and developing markets for other water resources, particularly in South Australia, but other states too. Yeah, look, certainly we've seen markets develop uh, in other water resources. Um, uh, ground in South Australia, um, we've actually had some markets that have been quite um, are quite mature. Um, we see quite a bit of groundwater movement, um, not significant volumes, but it has been active for some time in uh, in McLaren Vale, for example. Uh, ground small volumes of groundwater uh, that supplement the natural um, natural rainfall that they get for, for growing you know, different products down there. Um, 
also in uh, seeing the development of markets in through the Barossa uh, and through the, the southeast of, of South Australia, and particularly uh, the southeast of South Australia and and in the Mallee, uh, we, we've seen um, much more activity in in those markets in in recent uh, recent years. It's also the case right across the country that um, whilst yes, a lot of the focus has been on uh, the Murray-Darling Basin, particularly the southern Murray-Darling Basin, in the development of markets, a lot of the the lessons that we've learnt, a lot of the structures that have developed out of the Murray-Darling Basin and the Southern Murray-Darling Basin have spread across uh, water management and uh, the development of um, of regulation around water uh, into these other areas as they have been regulated. So throughout Queensland, uh, throughout the groundwater zones within New South Wales and the other uh, valleys and, and, and water resources within New South Wales, um, even down to, um, to Tasmania with the development of irrigation schemes within Tasmania, um, a water trading, a water sharing framework has been built into the um, into the structure of the development of those um, water areas. And, and again, it just gives irrigators the flexibility that in, in times of dry conditions or if there is a circumstance where an irrigator is looking to scale up or does require more water, the structure's already in place, it gives irrigators an ability to actually um, source that water and, and, a, and a market mechanism that can sit in behind it to allow that to occur. Yep, that's great. Thanks a lot, Alison. So there's about four or five questions still coming uh, coming in as we, as we speak, and we've got about uh, six, seven minutes left to go. Um, now, this next question, it goes to the issue of um, trust, I guess, and um, uh, and the feeling that, that people might be taking advantage of the uh, of the water trading operations. But I'll just put it to you and see where we go with this. Water trading has brought speculators into the market. What's the value of the speculator trading, and what effect does it have on the water price? In, it's in your face question, but... Yeah. It, these questions are being asked in the, in the marketplace. Yep. Look, look, ultimately, um, the ability for a speculator or somebody, maybe even an investor to come into the water space, um, ultimately, their ability to gain a return out of the, um, the investment that they've made has to be based and can only be based on the ability for a, um, an irrigator, uh, a producer to actually pay for and utilise um, that water. And that, that will be grounded in what they're able to value add uh, based on that megaliter of water. They can't pay what they can't pay. And if uh, if uh, the price asked is is too high, uh, they will um, they will go off and do something else. Uh, um, so certainly I'd say that, um, you know, whilst there is some, um, there, are, there are some out there that are, are purely buying and selling water uh, just for the sake of buying and selling water, um, it is actually um, a, a, a you know, significantly small uh, percentage of the market and um, there is not a capability. I mean, really, apart from perhaps the, uh, the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder, there is no one entity or one party uh, or group of parties that, that is able to combine uh, the sort of levels of um, water volume that could have a, um, a significant impact on the market. And ultimately, um, the main drivers of the market is, is weather yep. and uh, and the ability for an irrigator, uh, one industry competing against another to make a return out of the, the available water that, that is in the marketplace. I'd also say, um, possibly just to, to add to that, is that um, would be that certainly it's our, uh, what we see in the market is, is that, you know, probably the majority of speculators are actually um, irrigators and water users themselves in um, some of the risk management um, techniques that they have uh, in engaging with the market and uh, and, and by, by and large, um, the majority of your of of traders, if you like, are, are irrigators that have production outcomes uh, as well as uh, potentially a trading outcome. Yep, no, that's really good. There's probably a lot more things could be said there. There's probably a lot more things you'd like to say there, but we'll, we'll move straight on. Santosh, Diane, and Clarissa have some questions, and uh, look, I, I'll, I encourage you to put your hand up and ask live. If I've um, slowed everybody down by by, by saying you've got to have this perfect uh, AV and, and internet system. No, don't hesitate, put your hand up and we'll, and we'll uplift you. But let's get uh, cracking in with Santosh. We've got three or four minutes left. Santosh Pandey, who is the owner of water, federal, state governments or individuals, and who controls the environmental flows at natural streams? And there's two bits of that question there. Who owns the water uh, and who controls the environmental flows? So um, the water itself, um, obviously there's a resource uh, there and that resource has been allocated and uh, licensed to um, individuals or to entities, to water users. Um, some of that is historic, and obviously once that has been, once we've, um, we've licensed that, the, the sustainable volume of, of water that's, that's available, the sustainable take that's available, we have been early, uh, early adopters in Australia, although possibly not early enough to implement um, cap and trade systems, which was really to cap 
the amount of further extraction that, that could occur and then allow uh, trade um, between uh, irrigators and, and enable them to, uh, to top up or sell down uh, the volumes of water that they have available. So they are owned just in the same way somebody can own a house, own a piece of land, uh, you own a, um, a right, there's a titled right uh, to a, a share of the resource, that's your permanent right. And then based on, based on the conditions, the environmental inflows and, and what we, uh, we see uh, what we're seeing at the moment, obviously, um, lots of inflow coming in. Then there's allocations um, based on uh, how many of those water shares or water rights you hold and, and where your water right sits in the priority uh, of allocation uh, system. Um, right. I think the question around environmental flows, Trevor, where do they sit? Uh, there are rules-based environmental water, and that's part of the, uh, the water sharing rules between the states and, and within uh, catchments, uh, the required volumes of water that are needed to be put aside for for environment, and then there is entitlement-based environmental water, which is the which is basically the water that varying state governments and or the federal government have purchased from irrigators over the last uh, the last few twenty years, obviously now, um, and they receive an allocation just like any other license holder. There's no preference given to the environment uh, through that process. That's great. We've got about two minutes left, even less actually, but I'd like to get these last couple of questions in the three actually from Clarissa, Tim and Doanne. But let's start with Clarissa. How does the water trading market in Australia, how is it influenced, shall I say, or accounts for the need of environmental flows and recharging of waters to the aquifers? Do you get the gist of this question? How does the water trading market in Australia influence yeah. or accounts for the, the environmental and recharge to aquifers? Yeah. Yep. Um, Look, obviously, um, I mean, as far as the water sharing, uh, that really came comes down to um, uh, to the sustainable take, uh, and um, what we're talking the, the water that's trading in water markets or the water that is allocated a license to uh, to water users is what's been considered surplus to 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 the environmental requirements of the um, uh, of the river systems, and you know, I think we've got the balance wrong um, uh, as some systems have developed and, and obviously there's been a number of ways in which um, varying governments and the community has, has looked to address that. Uh, the buyback process, and new water sharing plans and potential uh, drawback or restriction on uh, on the amount of water that people can use. Um, so really two ways of, of addressing that. One was uh, obviously to ensure that the environment had enough, uh, enough of the take uh, put into the water sharing arrangements initially uh, and the second uh, way of addressing that is to utilise uh, the market mechanism to actually uh, remove the, the volumes that um, that are needed to, to, to move back to a sustainable uh, sustainable level. Well, I think we've got time for one more. We're just over the 30-minute mark. But look, Tim Pitts asked a, a critical question. How do you access your online water market info? Do you need to be an existing, existing licence holder? We can simply register, then learn pricing trends without participating in the market. Another question after that from Joanne about explaining the institution for water trading in Australia and the role of Waterfine, the role of the state authority. That's probably a bigger question which we can get to maybe after the, the webinar between Joanne and yourself. Yep, but this no, one, yeah. How do you access water line, online market? Yeah. So, so a number of, um, so I mean, from our point of view, we've, um, water information has been an important part of um, of providing and pricing information particularly has been is, is an integral part in in the whole structure and and, and the reason why uh, trading is such an important part of, of irrigated water management decisions because um, you know unless you can actually put a value on it you can't um, value uh, listing it and you can't value uh, what um, the implementation of, of efficiencies or, or other measures um, can can mean um, Information, water market information has historically been difficult but has matured significantly in the last uh, five or six years. And so um, we as Waterfine have always looked to provide transparent information uh, through our, our water market information system uh, and that's free and available to, to, to anybody to, to use. You just need to log on uh, and uh, register and you can get access to all of that, um, all of that data without actually necessarily trading or, or needing to trade. Um, a number of the, um, the registers, we, we take a view where we look at all the registers, we look at where transactions are occurring and we try and consolidate as much of that data into one, one point. But you can also go to the state-based uh, registers, you can go to the state-based water managers and uh, and source that data uh, directly from, from them. So there's certainly a, a strong movement towards being able to provide as much transparent information in this space as possible. 
That's fantastic. I'll, look, I appreciate this, and we're going to have to uh, call a halt there, but um, uh, there's obviously a lot more that we could talk about uh, as time goes by, but um, we'll be in touch uh, after this uh, webinar with the recording, and um, uh, if you have questions for Alistair, then uh, please, by all means, shoot them in our direction or in Alistair's direction at Waterfind. I think we're there. Uh, is there anything else we need to do right now? Thanks for participating. We really appreciate your uh, coming on board. And um, look, the last thing I'll ask is, as you uh, finish today, there's a uh, feedback form. that There'll be a, um, a URL there which you can go to. Thanks so much, everybody, for uh, for joining us in this uh, webinar today. We are, um, we'll be in touch with everybody anyway about that next webinar. Thanks for joining us today, everybody. Uh, look forward to seeing you again. Bye for now.